The Great Sonoran Desert lies in the southwestern corner of North America. Its most striking living feature is the saguaro cactus. Its size and beauty draws the eye, but it's much more than a simple landmark to those who live on it or in it. The interior of the cactus provides a secure nest for many creatures, a delicate and diversified community adapted to the extremes of the desert's day and night. Life in the desert depends on complex interrelationships between plants and animals. Standing tall, a dramatic vision, this is the saguaro. Mention desert, and it's only natural to think of vast, trackless wastes of burning, drifting sand. Visions of scorching winds coursing over the desolate dunes have made the word desert almost synonymous with lifeless. The Sonoran Desert is hot and dry, but hardly lifeless. This desert is more like a special forest whose trees are strikingly unusual. To many, the image of the saguaro cactus epitomizes the look of the American West. Ranging across the southern half of Arizona and into Mexico, the saguaro stands as a vivid contradiction to the notion that the desert is lifeless. Sometimes reaching heights of 50 feet and weighing as much as 10 tons, the saguaro is the largest member of the cactus family in the United States. In countless ways, the giant cactus offers the necessities of survival to a wide range of desert life. The gilded flicker finds it an ideal location to nest, as does the screech owl. Even a dead saguaro, held upright by its internal latticework of wood supports, provides shelter from the harsh environment. A pack rat escapes the heat, while below, in the root system, a rattlesnake hunts for food. Even bats occasionally roost inside a decaying saguaro. Too big to find space inside the cactus, a great horned owl, among the largest of the desert's predators, makes its sturdy nest in the forked branches. Also occupying the upper niche of the food chain are the hawks. The bay-winged hawk builds its nest in the forks of only the largest saguaros. High off the ground, the chicks can grow to maturity in perfect safety. The bay-winged hawk is the only bird of prey that lives in a cooperative society. As many as eight hawks, all from the same family group, will live in one area, often hunting together like a wolf pack. Last year's chicks, now nearly full grown, help out in hunting food for this year's newborn chicks. Sitting motionless on its high perch atop the cactus, the hawk keeps a sharp lookout for prey.
The rabbit, a mainstay in the hawk's diet, is too heavy to lift, so the hawk drags it back to the shade. After eating its fill, it carries parts of the carcass to its young in the nest. While other hawks in the extended family may help gather the food, only the parents do the feeding. The female shreds the food and tries to distribute it equally among her brood. Although the unusually close social behavior of the bay-winged hawk has been amply documented, scientists are at a loss to explain this maneuver. Up to four hawks have been seen stacked up like this on the tip of a cactus. Perhaps backstanding is the only way they can roost together. The smaller, more agile western kingbird will dive bomb the bay-winged hawk if it moves too close to its nest harassing the bigger bird until it decides to leave. The hawk rules the daytime sky, but the night belongs to another large bird of prey. The great horned owl, the nighttime counterpart of the hawk. The owl is an opportunist. Instead of building its own nest, it commandeers one that has already been built, usually that of a hawk. The owl feeds largely on gophers and pack rats and, like the hawk, often catches rabbits. But even though the two birds may live side by side, they hunt at different times, therefore minimizing competition for food. The nighttime desert provides excellent hunting. Rodents, avoiding the searing midday sun, are active at night, and so may become prey for silent hunters like the great horned owl. The real competition for food is not between birds of different species, but between chicks in the same nest. Though this young one has obviously had its fill, its watchful parent knows the job is never done and slips back into the night to search for more. The unique boot of the saguaro cactus, originally excavated from its soft flesh by a woodpecker, is now home to the tiny elf owl, one of the smallest owls in the world. The young elf owls find protection and plenty of room to grow in the abandoned woodpecker nest. The adult owls are only six inches long, but what the birds lack in stature, they make up for in numbers. The most numerous birds of prey in the desert, they hunt flying insects such as moths. Like most owls, they hunt at night and spend the daylight hours sleeping. In another boot, a pair of slightly larger screech owl chicks find their quarters rather crowded, but secure. The adult prefers to escape the confined conditions and naps on the porch. The architect of the boot is almost always the Gila woodpecker, 
often called the carpenter bird, for its skill in carving the raw cactus into a comfortable sanctuary. The male and female take turns gathering food and babysitting. The woodpecker feeds on the abundant insects found in and on the desert plants. The female, returning from gathering food, relieves the male. The woodpecker does not line its nest. Apparently, the bare interior of the cactus boot is comfortable enough. Another woodpecker's home seems safe from intrusion, but not so. The European starling has invaded the Sonoran Desert and poses a potential threat to the native birds. If the starling sees an unguarded nest with no young, it will steal it from the woodpeckers. All the starling needs is a second. The unwary woodpecker, away from its nest for only a moment, has lost its home. Often woodpeckers must make three or four nests before they can raise their young in peace. For the starling, possession is nine-tenths of the law. Woodpeckers, like this gilded flicker, may begin several nest holes before completing one. This apparent overabundance is misleading because many of the holes are too shallow for nesting. But any hole that's big enough becomes home to someone, such as these house sparrows. At the height of the breeding season, all the choice real estate has been taken. The cactus wren does not rely upon homes built by others, but constructs an enclosed nest of woven grass lined with feathers to protect its chicks from both heat and cold. The lofty cactus is the perfect sanctuary from predators. The Sonoran Desert is not always burning hot. Snow, though rare, is not unknown. But winter in the land of the saguaro is brief. While some of the birds migrate to warmer climates, reptiles, such as rattlesnakes, seek shelter from the sub-freezing temperatures. To help reduce their heat loss, great numbers of rattlesnakes often hibernate together in underground caves. But spring is never far off. The first warming rays of sun bring out the sleepers. The western diamondback and the chuckwalla bask in the welcome warmth. The sun-drenched days return, and the coo of the morning doves is only one of the many songs that fill the cactus forest. The winter brought welcome moisture to the desert, and in spring, the once forbidding landscape is blanketed with flowers. Desert flowers like larkspur, daisies, and brittle bush bloom profusely. But the explosion of color quickly subsides. The short spring fades into hot summer.
late May, the saguaro begins to bud. In the heat of the day, the buds remain tightly closed. Birds wait expectantly for the sun to set, anticipating the singular event to come. Then, in the cool hours of dusk, the miracle happens. Each bud opens only once and closes the next day, never to open again. The night creatures are quick to take advantage of the rich feast. Nectar-feeding bats are welcome dinner guests. Their migration north from Mexico follows the wave of the ripening blossoms. Their long snouts and tongues are perfectly adapted to drink the nectar deep within the blossoms. In the process, they carry a dusting of pollen to the next saguaro, thus cross-pollinating the cactus. Both plant and bat have evolved to rely upon each other. At dawn, the bats retreat to their roost, leaving the blossoms to other feeders. The large white flowers, perch conspicuously on the high arms of the saguaro, attract other potential pollinators. Bees descend on the blossoms in great numbers, wallowing in the protein-rich pollen and searching for the sweet nectar. The bee's only concern is to harvest the nutritious pollen and nectar for its hive, but its efforts may also result in the transfer of pollen from cactus to cactus. Briefly, the luxurious blooms provide a banquet to many of the desert's inhabitants. The birds must be quick to take advantage of the rich bounty. The flowers close in the heat of the day. They die and drop off, their purpose fulfilled. The pollen has been dispersed. 
In a month, the fruit will ripen. As the days become hotter, the desert animals confine their activity to the cooler morning hours. Water begins to disappear. The roadrunner and the coyote have found the last remaining water. Briefly, the few dwindling pools support a flurry of activity. Quail drink their fill as bees and wasps buzz over the last free moisture of the dry season. Ultimately, the sun has its way. The desert shrivels in its heat. But life goes on. A roadrunner searches for prey and flushes out a bull snake. The roadrunner is adept at catching snakes. It uses its superior speed and distracting maneuvers to confuse the snake and tease it into striking until it is exhausted. This technique not only works with the non-poisonous bull snake, but also on the more dangerous rattlesnakes. The roadrunner finds its opening and its meal. A turkey vulture rides the thermals, searching for casualties of the withering heat. Only insects, such as cicadas, are active at midday, when summer temperatures may soar to 115 degrees or more. The saguaro is well adapted to this heat. Its spines, actually highly modified leaves, provide shade from the sun's rays. Each spine's shadow may be minute, but the sheer number of them cool the cactus significantly. The accordion-like pleats of the waxy skin enable it to expand when water is plentiful and contract when it's not. At first glance, the skin appears smooth and featureless, but magnified a thousand times, its true texture is revealed. Tiny holes, called stomata, open only at night. They enable the cactus to breathe so that photosynthesis may take place and form new tissue. In the absence of green leaves, this process occurs on the saguaro surface. Other desert plants store what moisture they can in their roots and let their leaves and branches wilt away to reduce water loss. The animals have also adapted to the harsh conditions. 
the desert cottontail must survive on a diet of dried seeds. Its blood-engorged ears help to cool its body by dissipating excess heat. Superbly adapted to desert life is the kangaroo rat. Neither kangaroo nor rat. The little rodent is nocturnal, avoiding the worst part of the day. Its kidneys are so highly efficient that the rodent never needs to drink water. It can absorb enough moisture from the seeds it eats to survive. Reptiles with no internal mechanism to regulate their body temperatures have no choice but to hide from the heat. The hawks and other birds have few regulatory adaptations to deal with the heat. While the adult birds may be able to fly off to find shade, the chicks, confined to their nest on top of the cactus, resort to panting to cool off. The same is true for owls. By contrast, those who live inside the body of the saguaro are the lucky ones. 90% of the cactus is water, which insulates against the heat, keeping the nest as much as 10 degrees cooler than the outside. At night, the warmth absorbed during the day radiates into the nest, offsetting the evening's chill. Those who nest within the saguaro are thus spared the daily extremes of temperature. During the time of the summer solstice, the long hours of sunlight ripen the saguaro's fruit. The white-winged dove waits expectantly for the impending feast. And then, in the hottest part of the summer, there is plenty of food in the desert. The saguaro fruit splits open, exposing the red, pulpy interior, which is rich in nutrients and full of seeds. A single saguaro can produce several million seeds in a lifetime. The desert birds take advantage of the abundance. The fruit litters the ground with food, drawing other desert inhabitants into the open. Collared peccaries, or javelinas, supplement their diet with the saguaro fruit. Other animals enjoy the brief time of plenty. Any leftovers are efficiently whisked away by hordes of carpenter ants.
Each cactus can produce as many as 100 fruits in a season, and each fruit contains about 2,000 seeds. In some places, 90% of those seeds will be taken by the ants. The fruit isn't the only meal available at this time. There are those who come to feed on the feeders. The horned lizard hardly needs to move. Its dinner walks right by in front of it. The pickings are easy. Summer's bounty means food for the desert inhabitants and the certainty that the saguaro seeds will be spread far and wide. The fruit is also popular with other residents of the desert. The Papago Indians have lived in the area and harvested the saguaro fruit for centuries. Using long poles of saguaro wood, they gather the fruit to make syrup, jam, and ceremonial wine. Mary Miguel holds on to the tradition which is slowly fading away. I remember when I was a little girl, my grandmother used to go out and pick saguaro fruit. We pick them up and we split the fruit and put it in a pail. And we pick the dry ones and we mix it up. And when our pail gets full, we bring it home and we put it, dump it in the uh, top and uh, put water in there. And when they get wet, we mix it up, you know, squash the seeds. And then we cook it and drain it out. And we usually make about 10 gallons of syrup, 15 gallons of syrup. And then we start on our jams on the last part of the harvest. According to an ancient Papago tradition, the end of the harvest foretells the beginning of the rainy season. As soon as the harvest is brought to a close, clouds are seen approaching and soon thereafter it rains. In early July, the weather patterns in the tropics drive moist air up over the desert and the rains come. Soon the desert is alive and green again. Water is plentiful and plants flourish in the moist soil. those few saguaro seeds, lucky enough to have been deposited under a protective nurse plant, may now begin to grow. Shielded from temperature extremes and hungry animals, the tiny cactus grows very slowly. After two years, it may be only a quarter of an inch in diameter. 
a nine-year-old plant like this may reach just six inches in height. These are the perilous years for the saguaro. Out of the millions of seeds produced, only a precious sheltered few survive to outgrow and replace their nurse plants. High winds or lightning uproot older saguaros, killing the cactus, but creating an environment of a different and unexpected type. A large saguaro can weigh as much as 10 tons, most of which is water. Its death creates a temporary oasis. As a fallen cactus decays, plenty of moisture becomes available. So much, in fact, that a certain species of aquatic beetle finds a comfortable home in the pulpy interior. Aquatic beetles usually live in ponds or swamps, but these have adapted to life in the desert. Their keen sense of smell can lead them unerringly to a decaying cactus. This slimy environment also has its villain. The hister beetle is the local predator. Half an inch long, it plows through the rotting cactus in search of fly larvae and small insects. Its slick carapace enables its thin body to slice like a knife through the sticky mire. Many saguaros remain standing after they die, held upright by the wooden framework of the ribs within. The wreckage of these hulks supplies a dry home for other creatures. The black widow spider prefers the dark recesses of a dead saguaro where it spins its web, waits for prey, and lays its eggs. Maternal care is not a strong point with the black widow. Her young are on their own as soon as they're hatched. The tiny spiderlings crawl to the top of the cactus spire and release a filament of silk from their spinnerets. The first breeze that drifts by whisks the young spiders out into the world and to their own fate. It's called ballooning. The same space provides a home for the cactus mouse, which nests in the center of the dead cactus. Under the dry debris of a fallen cactus, the pack rat often builds its nest. The rodent forages at night, bringing seeds, flowers, and cactus fruit back to its underground den. The floor of its home becomes covered with its collection, which is cemented together by its own excretions. Amazingly, the pack rat's untidy habits supply valuable knowledge about the history of the Sonoran Desert. Dr. Tom Vandeventer, a scientist from the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, studies the waste piles, called middens, from ancient pack rat nests, searching for clues about the desert's past. I view myself as a paleoecologist. 
And that means I look at the relationships of plants and animals and their environment through time. The main tools that I use are pack rat middens. These are organic deposits which are built by pack rats and they're preserved in dry rock shelters and they contain plant fragments that are very well preserved and you can identify them usually to the particular species of plant and you can radiocarbon date and so we really look at these little um, collections of plant fragments through time and we were able to record changes in the, the vegetation in desert areas in the last 30 or 40,000 years. In the laboratory, saguaro seeds are isolated from the specimen. The ancient seeds are then treated to render microscopic bits of carbon, which are run through the carbon dating process. The computer tells Dr. Van de Venter that this specimen is about 6,600 years old. He has found that the saguaro reappeared here around 10,000 years ago, shortly after the last ice age. An even older Sonoran resident, Man, first appeared in this section of the continent 12,000 years ago, and he left his mark permanently etched in the stone. First, the prehistoric Hohokams and the Tohono O'Don Indians lived in the area. But it was the advent of the white man that had the most impact on the desert. The land was ceded to the United States from Mexico in 1853 via the Gadsden Purchase. And in 1879, the railhead reached Tucson. With the railroad came the first tourists. Some saguaro cacti alive today are old enough to have witnessed the Old West flourish and then become a dusty memory. The saguaro survived the days of the Wild West, but a new threat was yet to come. With the arrival of the railroad, cattle herding became profitable big business, and soon the desert was overrun by herds of hungry cattle. Overgrazing of the saguaro forest was the worst danger it had ever faced. The fragile ecosystem was nearly destroyed by man's ignorance. By comparing historic photographs with those taken more recently, it is easy to see the devastating effect the cattle had on the desert. Fearful that this precious environment would be lost forever, the United States government in 1932 set aside the land for Saguaro National Monument, hoping to preserve a part of this desert and its unique wildlife for future generations. In some cases, the saguaro and its attendant species can coexist with human progress. But just as often, the saguaro is in the way. Man is still moving in. As the popularity of the Sun Belt grows, so do the towns and cities in the desert. Real estate is booming, and the saguaro takes a back seat to the expansion. At some construction sites, the threatened cacti are saved. To move a 20-foot plant bristling with piercing spines takes great care. But a large one like this can bring $500 at a commercial nursery.
Because the saguaro's root system is so shallow, it's easily uprooted. A state permit is required to transplant a cactus and it's usually granted to move plants away from construction projects. On large construction sites, however, the cost of transplanting the cactus is considered excessive. The saguaro is just an obstacle to be rid of. In the cause of progress, the bulldozer has the final say. Ironically, the removal of a single saguaro without a permit is a crime carrying a fine of $500. In other situations, the cactus is killed piecemeal, ignored as if it weren't there. Lead is as deadly to the saguaro as is the bulldozer's blade. Yet the great cactus remains an important symbol to the people of the area. grow saguaros under controlled conditions with phenomenal success. In the wild, the odds are as high as 20 million to one that a seed will grow to maturity. But in the greenhouses, as many as 90% survive. One greenhouse can sell as many as 200,000 saguaros a year. But the saguaro is much more than a commercial commodity. Study of the cactus is of extreme importance if the dynamics of the desert are to be understood. Dr. Charles Lowe of the University of Arizona in Tucson is a pioneer in saguaro research. 36 years ago, he led the team that discovered the cause of an apparent epidemic that was killing the cactus throughout the Sonoran. Now, the work began in the 1950s when we realized that freezing was killing saguaros and not the so-called bacterial necrosis disease. Freezing occurs in the winter time. The results of those freezes are often not seen until later in the year, in the spring, in April and May, when the weather warms up. And then dripping is seen, uh, a brown to black dripping of a bacterial material which actually is a decomposing bacterium that is set in the saguaro on the dead and dying tissues caused by freezing. Often while walking through the Sonoran Desert you will see large saguaros with many twisted bent arms. These are the result of freezing during the January freezes. The freezing taking place at the base of the arms causes the heavy weight of the arm to bend downward in the twisted, deformed picture that you see uh, long after the freeze is gone. The freezing rings you see usually at the base of saguaros in this area are due to freezing of the plant when it was smaller. The crown froze plant did not die, it regrew from that area, which was the top of the smaller plant. 
Like a doctor making house calls, Lowe spends countless hours with his spiny patients. He records and monitors temperature variations, learning how the plant responds to the extremes of a typical desert day. Through the efforts of people like Dr. Lowe, we learn more about this unique plant and its relationship to the changing environment. As the saguaro lives, so will the delicate web of life of which it is a part. Once the web has been broken, the desert may become lifeless indeed. As some flowers close, others prepare to open. Life in the desert is a continuing renewal of nature's miracle. The saguaro cactus stands like a sentinel but it's more than a dramatic symbol of the American West. It's the guardian of life's outpost in the desert.